count. Ah, one more thing here. Let's go ahead and do TX for transaction equals lending pool dot deposit. And we're going to go ahead and once again, we're going to wait for one block confirmation. Wait one. Transactions still being processed. So now if we run Brownie run scripts, Ave borrowed up high. We can see that this actually went through fine. All right, now that we have some collateral deposited, we can go ahead and actually take out a borrow. We can go ahead and borrow some other asset. The question is going to be how much? How much can we actually borrow? How much should we borrow? What would result in a positive health factor? Well, maybe we should actually pull off chain some of our stats. How much do we actually have deposited? How much collateral we have? How much debt we have? And so on and so forth. That way, in the future, when we don't start clean, we can take some inventory of where we stand with our collateral and our debts. At the Ave documentation, we can go ahead and see this, this function called get user account data. This is going to return the user account data across all reserves. So it's going to get the total collateral that we've deposited in terms of Ethereum. It's going to get our total debt in terms of Ethereum, how much we can borrow, the borrowing power that we have, the liquidation threshold or how close to that liquidation threshold will be the loan to value ratio, and again, this health factor. This health factor is obviously incredibly important because if it drops below one or reaches one, users can call this liquidation call. Now this function returns all these variables, but for now, we really only care about how much collateral we have, how much debt we have, and how much we're available to borrow. So let's go ahead and write a function that will actually sort that out for us. We'll call it get borrowable data borrowable data. So let's go ahead and create this. Def get borrowable data. And we're going to pass in the lending pool as a first parameter and then the account as a second parameter. Because we're looking to call this function on the lending pool from an account. So let's go ahead and just call that function. So we'll do lending pool dot get user account data. And we'll pass in account dot address. Because if we look at the API again, all that it needs is a user's address to get started here. And it returns one, two, three, four, five, six variables. So we can go ahead and get all of them with this tuple syntax here. So we'll say total collateral ETH, total debt ETH, available borrow ETH, current liquidation threshold, loan to value, and then the health factor. So it's with this syntax here that we can actually get all of these variables with this one call. And again, this get user account data is a view function, so we don't need to spend any gas. All of these variables are going to be returned in terms of way. So let's just go ahead and convert these from way to something that makes a little bit more sense to us. So we want to get this available borrow ETH so we can figure out how much we can borrow. Let's get that in terms that we can actually understand. So we'll do from way available borrow ETH in terms of ether. We'll do total collateral ETH equals web three that from way. We'll do total collateral ETH ether excuse me, ether. And then we'll do total debt ETH equals same thing, web three dot from way, total debt ETH in terms of ethers. And let's even do a little print F statement for each one of these. So we'll do print F. This F allows us to put variables inside the print function. And we'll say you have total collateral ETH worth of ETH deposited. And we'll even copy paste that a couple times and we'll change this one to total debt ETH and we'll change this one to available borrow ETH. So we'll say you have worth of ETH deposited, you have total debt ETH worth of F borrowed, and you can borrow available borrow ETH worth of ETH. And then we're going to go ahead and return. Again, we're going to use this tuple syntax so we can return two variables. 
and we're going to say a float of this available borrow ETH and a float of the total debt ETH. The reason that we have to add this float variable here is that without it, some of the math that we're going to try to do later won't pan out as well. So now we have this function, get borrowable data. We're going to pass the lending pool and we're going to pass our account here. Since we're returning the borrowable ETH and the total debt, we can say borrowable ETH and then total debt equals that function right there. So let's go ahead and try this out with Brian and run scripts, Ave borrowed a phi, pi. Again, because in our config, we have a default network of mainnet fork. Things seem to be approving, things seem to be depositing, and awesome. We have we have our output here. We deposited 0 0.1 worth of F. We have zero F borrowed, and we can borrow 0 0.8 worth of F. Yes, this is correct. Even though we have 0 0.1 F deposited, we can only borrow 0 0.08. This is because the liquidation thresholds of different assets are different. In this risk parameters documentation here, we can see the different liquidation thresholds on the different assets. We can see that Ethereum has an 80% loan to value. So with Ethereum, we can only borrow up to 80% of the deposit assets that we have. And if we have more than 82.5% borrowed, we'll actually get liquidated. It also tells about the liquidation bonus, reserve factor, and some other helpful pieces in here as well. But now that we have this borrowable ETH amount, we can go ahead and actually borrow some DAI. So let's do a quick print saying, let's borrow. Now, in order for us to borrow some DAI, we also need to get the conversion rate. We need to get DAI in terms of F. So we're going to have to use some price feed here. Luckily, we already know how to work with Chainlink and how to get price feeds. Aave uses the Chainlink price feeds as well. So we're using the exact same conversion rate tools that Aave is going to use. So let's go ahead and create a function to get us this conversion rate. We'll say the die to F price is equal to get asset price. And then in here, we'll pass the die F price feed. This will be the address of the die Ethereum conversion rate. Let's go ahead and, and create this function. We'll call it def get asset price. And the parameter it needs is going to be price feed address. So the first thing that we're going to need is we're going to need to get this die F price feed. Where can we get this? Well, as we know, per usual, we'll head over to the Chainlink documentation. We'll go to Ethereum price feeds. We'll find DAI. We'll look, grab this. And we'll paste it into our config for mainnet. So we can go ahead and add the DAI F price feed in here and paste it into our config. Again, if we want to test with the Coven, we can obviously just scroll down. Look for Coven, find the DAI F right here, grab that address pop it in for Coven. And then we can get this the same way that we got the address of the WETH token. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy this, paste it here. But instead of having WETH token in here, we'll do DAI F price feed. And now we have a way to change the price feed address depending on what network we're on. So in our get asset price function, we're going to do the same exact thing that we always do. We're going to grab an ABI and an address to work with the contract. So again, we can get the ABI by just working directly with the interface. So we'll say die F price feed equals interface dot aggregator V3 interface, because this is the name of the price feed interface, which again, if we look at our interfaces, it looks like we don't actually have. So what we can do is we can go to the Chainlink GitHub or uh, as you guys are already starting to figure out, all my example code has all these interfaces as well, but we can go right to the source too. What we can do, we go here, we go to contracts, we go to add source, we do 0.6, we do interfaces, and right here is the aggregator V3 interface. So if we want, we can just copy this whole thing, move back over to our interfaces, new file, and this file is actually named aggregator v3 interface. You could call it i aggregator v3 or aggregator v3 interface. You could keep it with i aggregator v3 dot soul to keep with the convention that we have, or you can just call it aggregator 
v3 interface dot sol to keep in line with what the chain link code is actually called in. I'm going to call mine aggregator v3 interface. You notice a couple different projects have a couple different conventions. But now that we have it saved, we can do interface the aggregator v3 interface and we'll pass it this price feed address. Now this die f price feed is going to be a contract that we can call a function on. And again, you can always refer back to the get the latest price documentation to see how to actually work with it. There's even some Python code here for working with it in Web3. We're going to go ahead and call this latest round data function, which we can also find in our aggregator v3 interface, this latest round data, which returns a round ID, answer, started at, ended at, and answered in round. All we're really concerned with is this answer bit here. So the way we can do this is we can say latest price equals die, die at price feed, that latest round data. And instead of grabbing all five of these, one, two, three, four, five, what we can do is we can actually just grab the price, which is at the one index. So round ID is at zero, price is at one, start at two, etc. So we can just say the first index, and then we can return a float of this latest price. We can even print another printf statement. We die f price is latest price. So let's go ahead and run this. And great, we have the die f price feed here, which of course we know that looking at this right now, this isn't in the right units. We know that the die f price feed has 18 decimal places. So what we can do then is we know that this number would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This number is really 0 0.0004 blah, 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 blah. So maybe we don't want to return it like so. Maybe we want to say the die f price feed is, and we add a little bit of web3.py to make this make a little bit more sense. So we'll say web3 dot from way, and we'll add this latest price bit in here, comma, ether. Maybe we'll even do a converted latest price which is going to be equal to web3 that from way latest price ether and we'll print that out instead so let's go ahead and run this again all right that looks a little bit more accurate perfect okay great now we have the die eth price we're getting really close to being able to borrow this actual asset and let's even return this converted latest price here just so that we're always working in units that we understand Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Now we can calculate the amount of die that we want to borrow. We can find this by doing a little bit of math. We're going to do the reciprocal of the die ETH price times our borrowable ETH. And just to be safe, we're going to times it by 0 0.95. So this line, we're converting our borrowable ETH to borrowable die, and then we're timesing it by 95%. We're timing it by 95% because we don't want to get liquidated. So we're going to be a little bit more cautious. Remember how we slid that sliding scale around to make it safer and less safe? Well, the lower percentage that we actually borrow, maybe we even borrow 50% of our collateral, the safer that we're going to be. So keep that in mind when you're deciding how much to actually borrow if you want to run this in a production environment. So now that we have this amount die to borrow, let's even print it out. Let's say print F, we are going to borrow amount die to borrow, die, and then we're finally gonna do it. Now we will borrow. Looking at the Aave documentation, we can look at their borrow function and we can see the API here. Let's go ahead, let's go ahead and call this function. So we'll do borrow transaction. It's gonna be equal to lending pool dot borrow. Let's look at those parameters. So the asset that we wanna borrow, die address. So first we should get a die address which we can, once again, we'll want to put in our config. So we'll go over to our config and we'll add a die address or a die token here, which we can find on etherscan die token. It looks like this is the token right here. So we'll copy this address for mainnet. Remember, if you want to run this on Coven, you're also going to need to have a die token for Coven. Now on testnets, Avi actually changes up where the tokens for its testnets are actually going to be. So if we go to their documentation, we go to deployed contracts, 
and we go to Coven here, you'll always see this little flag thing pop up. Say, so always ensure you're using the latest lending pool address since Coven is updated from time to time. It's going to be the same thing if we scroll down for tokens. They have an up-to-date list of Coven addresses in a JSON file here. So it looks kind of gross, but if we look up DAI, we can see symbol DAI and the address of DAI on the Coven testnet. So sometimes this does change. So if you run into an issue, maybe it's because the DAI token that you were working with on their Coven testnet has actually changed. Then we're going to do config networks, network.showactive, DAI token. Great. Now let's move on to the next parameter. The amount, which we just figured out here, amount died to borrow, which we do need to change back to way. So we're going to do web three, web two way, amount died to borrow, ether. Because right now, amount died to borrow is in our human readable version, which we need it in way. Then our interest rate mode, which is going to be stable or variable. Stable is where it, the interest rate will always be exactly the same. Variable will change depending on a lot of different things going on with Aave. For safety, we're just going to go ahead and add one here. Then we're going to do a referral code and on behalf of. So referral codes no longer exist. So we'll leave zero. And it's going to be on behalf of ourself. So we'll do account.address. And then, of course, we have to do a from account. Then we'll wait for this transaction to complete. And if we've done this right, we should have borrowed some DAI programmatically from the Aave protocol. So let's even print, we borrowed some DAI. And we can once again call our get borrowable data function. Since this get borrowable data function will print out our new count information for how much we borrowed. So let's go ahead and run this on mainnet fork again. Awesome. So if we've done this correctly, we now see that we've borrowed some DAI. So we can see here, we now have 0.1 worth of F deposited, 0.059999 worth of F borrowed, uh, and we can borrow a little bit more worth of F. This 0.75999 is actually the DAI that we've borrowed. So we've deposited some ETH and we've borrowed some DAI and obviously telling us how much that DAI converted to ETH so we actually borrowed 160 DAI, which is great. All right, we've now learned how to borrow everything, which is fantastic. Let's go ahead and actually repay that back. So we're gonna call their repay function. And let's just put this into its own function called repay all. And we'll give it the amount that we want to repay, the lending pool address and our account. So let's call, let's define repay all, where we're just gonna repay everything that we have. And again, we're going to add an amount, lending pool, and account for parameters. So if we're going to pay back this network, the first thing that we need to do is actually call the approve function and approve that we're going to pay back. So the first thing we're going to have to do, per usual, is we're going to actually have to approve that ERC-20. So let's say how much we're going to approve, web3.2way, amount, ether, to the lending pool and we'll grab it from the config networks network.show active and this is going to be the die token again and of course with our account i believe our approve erc20 already calls wait so we don't have to call it so once we approve, we're going to be using this die that we borrowed to pay most of what we have borrowed back. Now we're going to call the repay function. So we'll say repay TX equals lending pool dot repay. First, we need the asset that we're going to use to repay, which we're going to use config networks network.show active die token the amount which is going to be passed in here amount the rate mode which we've hard coded to one and the address on behalf of which is going to be account.address 
And then of course, we always have to do from count. Then we're gonna do repay tx dot wait. We're gonna wait one block confirmation. And then we'll print repaid. Whew. And if we've done all this right, we'll do one more print line saying, you just deposited, borrowed, and repaid with Ave, Brownie, and Chainlink. Whew. All right, moment of truth. Let's see if this works. Whew, we did it, repaid. You just deposited, borrowed, and repaid with Ave, Brownie, and Chainlink. Awesome work. Now, if you want to, what we can also do is we can see if this will work with our wallet address here. So what I can do is I can copy my address, go to Cove and Etherscan, and paste it in here. And right now we can see that I have a whole bunch of link and some ether. What I can do is actually test everything that we just ran through on the Coven testnet and see everything happen right on this Etherscan address. So if we've been following along correctly and we've added contract addresses appropriately, we should be able to run the exact same script on the Coven testnet. I'm gonna do one additional thing here though. I'm going to have us not repay so we can see us with a little bit of debt. So let's go ahead and run Brownie, run scripts, Ave Barta Pi, and we'll change to network Coven. And now it's gonna take a lot longer as we've seen before, because we're actually making these transactions on a real network. Whoops, it looks like I got one of the die F price feeds wrong for Coven. So I can once again, just go over to the documentation, die F, and it looks like this is the real address for Coven. So we'll copy that, paste it in here. Whoops, we should also probably have some WETH token. So first, let's go ahead and run our get with script for Coven. And we're gonna change this account to get account. Brownie, run scripts, get with.py, network Coven. From our helpful scripts. That way we can actually, that way we can actually use our wallets correctly. All right, great. So now we have 0 0.1 with. And actually, again, what we can do is grab this address here, add token, paste it in, add tokens for the WETH token. And now we can see we have 0 0.1 WETH, which is perfect. So now that we have some WETH, we can run the borrow script. Ave Brownie run scripts, Ave borrow network Coven. And wow, we can see that everything went through correctly and successfully. So since I actually commented out this repay function, we still should have die in our address here, in our wallet here. And again, we can see that by going to our Brownie config, grabbing this die token address, add token, custom tokens, next, add tokens. And we can see we do indeed have 160 die in our wallet. We have no WEF since it'll be in Ave now, and we have borrowed die instead. You can also see that we now have this AWEF if we added it from when we were working with the UI. We have this interest bearing WEF instead of regular wrapped Ethereum. Let's look at one of these transactions. We can see that our borrowed transaction gave us some stable debt bearing die and also some die. So we owe Ave some die from this debt. We got some debt, we got some die and we gave out some Aave interest bearing die to the rest of the Aave protocol. You'll notice now, if we go to testnet.ave.com dash dashboard, we'll see exactly what our script just did. We have 160 die borrowed and we have 0.1 ETH deposited. If we wanna repay our funds, we can do it with our current collateral or from our wallet balance. And you'll notice something, if I try to repay everything from my wallet, all the die that I've actually borrowed You'll notice we don't have enough funds to repay the full amount. This is because since we actually borrowed a little bit, we've accrued some of that interest. So we actually owe more back than we originally borrowed. That's how the loans work. So when you're designing this repay functions, be sure to have that in mind. 
you can also have your repay be minus one to repay the entire debt. It's recommended to send an amount slightly higher than the current amount borrowed. But in any case, maybe we say we want to do from our current wallet, we'll hit max, but maybe we want to actually just repay with our current collateral. We can go ahead and repay the maximum amount. Again, we could do this all from the UI, we'll approve, and this is exactly what our repay function actually did. And now we're all repaid up. So we go back to our dashboard and we hit refresh. We'll see, we just have a tiny bit of Ethereum and no more borrowed assets. Awesome, you've essentially learned everything that we need to go through for here. This is a massive step forward in teaching you how to become quantitative DeFi wizards and build really robust applications and really robust financial applications in the DeFi world. Now, something I wanna point out, even though this isn't a Python course and we're teaching more about Solidity and smart contracts, it's still in your best interest to test these functions. Yes, I know they're Python functions, but it's still gonna be in your best interest to test them to make sure your application always works as you expect it to. Now, I'm not going to go through this testing suite that I put here, but it's a really simple testing suite to test some of the different functions that we created. It can be really helpful, especially for something like get asset price, where the math might be a little bit off and you wanna make sure it's correctly. Again, link in the description to seeing some of these tests. This is actually gonna be even easier than that lottery contract that we did since we're just testing Python functions. And again, you can test these all with Brownie tests. All right, you are all doing fantastically. Now is another fantastic time to take a break, go for a walk, get some food, because our next session, our next lesson, we're gonna be learning about NFTs, how to build them, use them, and deploy them. Look, NFTs are hot right now. NFTs, also known as ERC-721s, are a token standard that was created on the Ethereum platform. NFT stands for non-fungible token and is a token standard similar to the ERC-20. Again, ERC-20s like Link, Aave, Maker, all those goodies that are found on the Ethereum chain. An NFT or a non-fungible token is a token that is non-fungible. This means that they are starkly unique from each other and one token isn't interchangeable with any other token of its class. A good way to think about it is one dollar is interchangeable with any other dollar. One dollar is gonna have the same value of another dollar. Those are fungible tokens. That's like ERC-20s. One link is always gonna be equivalent to one other link. By contrast, is gonna be NFTs. Those of you nerds out there would know, like a Pokemon would be a good example of an NFT. Your one Pokemon is gonna have different stats, different movesets, and isn't interchangeable with any other Pokemon. Or maybe a more relatable one is like a trading card, a unique piece of art, or the like. So that's what these NFTs are. They are non-fungible, non-interchangeable tokens that for the moment are best represented or thought about as digital pieces of art that are incorruptible and have a permanent history of who's owned them, who's deployed them, etc. Now, like I said, NFTs are just a token standard. So you can actually make them do much more than just be art. You can give them stats, you can make them battle, you can do really unique things with them, you can do pretty much whatever you want with them, but right now the easiest way to think about it and the most popular way to think about it is by calling them art, art, art. It's art. Or some type of collectible or just anything that's unique. Now they've been getting a ton of buzz recently because we've been seeing more and more of these being sold at insane prices. Like we saw Axe Infinity sell nine plots of their land, nine plots of their unique land for $1.5 million. We also saw the original creator of the Neon Cat, you know, this cat, sold for like 300 ETH. So like I said, they're just tokens that are deployed on a smart contract platform and you can view them on different NFT platforms like OpenSea or Rarible. And these are the NFT marketplaces that let people buy and sell them. You obviously can do that without these marketplaces because it's a decentralized, but they help and give a good user interface. So that's the basic gist of it. Let's talk some more about the standards. The ERC721 standard or the NFT standard. This is the basis of it all. There is another standard that's semi-fungible tokens, the 1155. We're not gonna talk about that here, but you can check it out. The main differences between a 721 and an ERC-20, on ERC-20s, they have a really simple mapping between 
an address, and how much that address holds. 721s have unique token IDs. Each token ID has a unique owner. And in addition, they have what's called a token URI, which we'll talk about in a minute. Each token is unique. Each token ID represents a unique asset. So since these assets are unique and we want to be able to visualize them and show what they actually look like, we need to define those attributes of the object. If it's a piece of art, we need a way to define what that art looks like. If it's some type of character in a game, we need a way to define that character's stats in the NFT. This is where metadata and token URIs come in. So if you know anything about Ethereum, you know that sometimes gas prices can get pretty high, especially when it comes to storing a lot of space, it can get really, really expensive. So one of your first questions might be, well, are they storing these images and, and these art pieces on chain? And the answer is sometimes. Back when they were coming up with NFTs and artists were deploying stuff, the ETH devs and the artists were like, yeah, art, let's do that art. I'm just gonna deploy this one megabyte image onto the Ethereum chain, and oh God, it's so much gas expensive. How do I hit the delete button? How do I? It's not dumb. It's not deleting. <laughs> and they realized that if they put all this art on chain, it was going to be incredibly expensive. So to get around this, what they did is they put in the standard what's called a token URI. This is a universally unique indicator of what that asset or what that token looks like and what the attributes of that token are. And you can use something like a centralized API or IPFS to actually get that token URI. A typical token URI has to return something in this format like this, where it has the name, the image location, the description, and then any attributes below. Now, if you're like me, your first question would probably be, We pull from a single source. Seems pretty centralized. This is a current limitation of the NFT ecosystem. There is often this talk of on-chain metadata versus off-chain metadata. Because it is so much easier and cheaper to store all your metadata off-chain, a lot of people will use something like IPFS that is decentralized, but does take a little bit of centrality to keep persisting, but they can also use their own centralized API. However, obviously, if that goes down, then you lose your image, you lose everything associated with your NFT. Because of this, most NFT marketplaces actually can't and won't read off on-chain attributes or on-chain metadata because they're so used to looking for the token URI. Obviously, if you do off-chain metadata, you can't do anything really cool or really interesting or have any games with your NFTs. For example, if you wanted to create an on-chain Pokemon game, all your attributes would need to be on-chain in order for your Pokemon to interact with each other. Because if it was off-chain, then that becomes a lot harder to cryptographically prove. So if you're new with NFTs and you're like, wait, this is kind of a lot of information, I'll make it easy for you. If you're looking to render an image of an NFT, add your image to IPFS, add a metadata file pointing to that image file on IPFS, and then grab that token URI and put it and set it as your NFT. The Chainlink D&D article does a great job of walking you through this and showing you how to do this. So be sure to read that if you're looking to learn how to do that. So all the code that we're gonna be working with is actually available for you in this NFT mix, Brownie mix. It's an official Brownie mix, and it allows us to deploy these three adorably cute dogs. And there are two different types of contracts that we're gonna be working with. We're gonna be first working with a simple collectible, and then we're gonna work with an advanced collectible. The simple collectible is, is gonna be a very simple ERC-721 standard. We're not gonna really add any bells and whistles other than give it like a name. And then our advanced collectible is gonna take advantage of some of those more advanced true scarcity features that we were talking about. So protocols like Avagochi and EtherCards use Chainlink VRF to get verifiably random numbers to create verifiably scarce NFTs. Something that's important to keep in mind is that in the real world, when companies create trading cards, there's no way to prove how scarce or how valuable these trading cards actually are. If we use a verifiable random number, then whoever is deploying these NFTs can't even control how rare these NFTs really are. So we get this verifiable scarcity and this verifiable rarity, which add some value to the tokens. If you want to just go ahead and work right from the Brownie mix, you can absolutely just run Brownie fake NFT mix and then CD into NFT. And all of our code is gonna be right in here. We're gonna go through and deploy and develop everything from scratch because we're gonna actually take some previous concepts that we've learned, improve on them, and we're gonna learn a lot of nitty gritty, interesting pieces about making this hybrid smart contract. Because these NFTs really are a perfect example of a hybrid smart contract. They have some off-chain component interaction with a random number and we're storing their metadata with IPFS. And I'll explain IPFS a little bit more in depth as we go on here. So let's go ahead and get to it. I'm gonna go ahead and make a new directory called NFT demo. I'm gonna CD into it, code, period. 
And perfect. I have a blank project here and you already know what the first step we're going to do is, is do brownie init to create our blank brownie repository. Now let's go ahead and create our first contract. We'll call this simple collectible dot soul. Since this is going to be, since this is going to be a simple collectible, a simple NFT that we're going to get started with. Now, similar to the ERC 20, this ERC 721 standard has a number of functions that we can actually work with. We can go ahead and even look at the 721, the ERC 721 non fungible token standard on the eips.ethereum.org website. And we can see a sample interface and some sample events and some functions and kind of everything that we've grown to know and love. And once again, instead of us kind of recoding, copy pasting all of this from scratch, we're going to be using, we're going to be using open Zeppelin's ERC 721 documentation for this. Now we're going to be working with version 3.x. There is a version 4.x that has come out using version 3.x of their open Zeppelin contracts is also, I think a little bit easier to explain. But again, those of you who want to challenge yourself, definitely try their 4.x version. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. First, we'll do our, S our SPDX license identifier, MIT. Then we'll choose our Solidity version. We're going to use Pragma Solidity 0.6.6. .6. But again, most of this should work for 0.8 moving forward. And then we're going to go ahead and look at the Open Zeppelin ERC721 documentation and we're going to go ahead and grab this line right here import open zeppelin slash contracts token erc721 erc721.soul you can even see a sample erc721 that they give you and this is actually going to be similar to the erc721 that we're going to make so we're going to go ahead and paste that and of course since we're doing this at open zeppelin slash contracts we're going to need to create our brownie config And same as always, dependencies is going to be open Zeppelin slash open Zeppelin contracts. And again, like I said, we're version, we're using version three. So 3.4.0 again, and then we'll do a compiler. Sulk remappings. And we'll say at open Zeppelin equals this. And great. Let's even try to just compile this right now. Run and compile. And perfect. It has been compiled. Now, similarly to our ERC 20 that we did with open Zeppelin, we're going to do the same startup here. So we're going to say contract simple collectible is ERC 721. And this is how we're going to inherit all of those functions in the ERC 721 token standard here. And we can start adding R and we can start coding our simple ERC 721. Now for our ERC 721, we're going to make it be a couple of these cute, adorable dogs. So it's going to be one of these three dogs for our simple collectible. We're just going to go ahead and use the pug here. So so you can use any image that you want for this demo. Um, however, if you want to just follow along with us, we can just download this dog and we'll call it pug, create a new folder here called IMG. And then I'm just going to add pug.png to this IMG folder. So this is going to be the NFT that we're going to deploy. We're going to deploy this very simple pug for our smart contract. So we're going to be deploying this pug. This is the image that we're going to use for our NFT. It's going to be this adorable pug. So let's go ahead and create the rest of the contract for this pug. So the first thing we're going to make is our constructor. It's going to take no input parameters. It's going to be a public constructor. And then we're going to go ahead and use the ERC 721 constructor, which if we look at the documentation, we give it a name and then a symbol. We're going to use the ERC 721 constructor parameters which is going to be a name, which we're going to say is doggy and a symbol, which we're going to say is dog and perfect. That's all we really need to do for the first part. This NFT contract is actually what's known as a factory contract. There's a main contract and in it, it has a list of all the NFTs and the owners that are of this type of NFT. So in this example, 
all of the type of NFT is just going to be this pug and it's just going to be this dog. And we actually need a function to mint new NFTs based off of this pug. Now we can absolutely have an NFT factory contract that only creates one single NFT, but we're going to use this factory implementation to create multiple NFTs. We're going to do it with a function called create collectible. This will create a new NFT and assign it to whoever called this function. So anyone can come here and create a new puppy for themselves, or in other words, adopt a puppy. So we're going to say function create collectible public. And we're going to say returns you went 256. We'll see why we need to do this in a minute. Now, when we create this collectible, all we're doing is we're assigning a new token ID to a new owner. And if we look at the open Zeppelin ERC 721 GitHub, we can see they have this safe mint function. This is the function that they use to mint or create a new NFT. This function, it's it takes a new address to which is going to be the new owner of the NFT and a token ID. Every NFT in this factory contract has a unique token ID. We're going to have our token IDs start from zero and, and just increment every time we have a new token minted. This safe mint function calls this safe mint function, which calls this minting function. So if you're looking at the code here, this mint function is really the, the function that calls and creates this NFT. You'll see actually that they just have two mappings that they update. They update this owners mapping, which is just a mapping of token IDs to the owners of the token IDs. And then they update this balances mapping, which is a mapping of owner address to the token count. So the number of tokens that an owner actually has, and that's all that's happening when we call this mint or in our case, safe mint function, the difference between safe mint and mint is safe mint checks to see if a token ID has already been used or not. And this way we don't actually override who owns tokens and who owns token IDs. So we're going to use the safe mint function. So first we need to think, okay, well, we're going to need to a way to count these token IDs so that every single person has a unique token ID. So let's create a global variable, UN256 public token counter, and we'll initialize it token counter to zero. Of course, this is the same as initializing token counter to zero, but let's just make it very explicit. So when we create a new collectible, we're going to say you went 256 new token ID is going to be equal to this token counter. And we're going to iterate this every time we mint a new token. So for example, we're going to iterate that in this create collectible here. So new token ID equals token counter. We're going to call this safe mint function, since we're inheriting it from open Zeppelin's ERC 721, we need to give it this new NFT and owner, which is going to be message.sender. So whoever calls this function, and then we need to give it a unique token ID, which is going to be this new token ID. Now, whenever we mint one, we're going to want to increment this token counter. So then we can say token counter equals token counter plus one, and we can then return this new token ID. So we'll return the token ID of the token that we just created. And boom, if you're looking for an incredibly minimalistic contract to deploy NFTs, this is all that you need. So we can run Brownie compile to make sure we did everything right. And product has been compiled. We can see it in the build. So great job. Obviously this might be a little dissatisfying to you after the breakdown that we just gave. How do we view this token? What does this token look like? I thought we wanted this to be a doggy. How do we know that this looks like a dog? How do we get this image on the blockchain? This is where metadata is going to come into play. Now, if we look at the original ERC 721, there is this part called the metadata extension is optional for ERC 721 smart contracts. As we've talked about, anytime you make a transaction on chain, it costs some gas, even very tiny amounts of data can cost more and more gas. Images are much bigger than these little bits of data here, and they can cost a lot more gas. So when this standard was being created, the developers kept this in mind and knew that storing entire images and entire GIFs and entire videos on chain was going to be incredibly costly. So they added this piece about metadatas and token URIs. The token URI is a distinct uniform resource identifier for a given asset. 
This is an example of a URI and the metadata that we're going to be demoing today. A URI is just a unique resource identifier. So this can be something like HTTPS or IPFS or any URL string that uniquely points to some metadata. Your metadata file is going to look like this. It's going to have a title for the title of the NFT. It can have a type and it can have all these different properties or stats or attributes. For example, we're going to have our pug NFT, which is going to be defined like this. It's going to have a name as pug. Description is going to be an adorable pug pup. And it's going to have what's called the image URI, which defines what the token actually looks like. And if we copy paste this into another browser, we get returned this. It's this token URI with this metadata JSON object that's going to enable different NFT platforms to actually render our NFT. So this is an example of what this pug is going to look like on different NFT marketplaces like OpenSea. Platforms like OpenSea understand that they need to show this image, they need to use this name, they need to use this description and have these traits. So if we look back at this NFT on OpenSea, we can see the name is pug. We can see the description here. If we go to levels, we see its cuteness is 100 out of 100. Now this of course leads us to a really interesting point. If we're storing the image off chain, then how is this image decentralized? If we're storing this image off chain, how can we guarantee this NFT is going to stay forever? Now this leads us into a little tidbit about storing data on the blockchain. As of current recording, storing a lot of data on chain can get incredibly expensive. The more data that you store, the more transactions that you have to make to store that data on chain and the more gas that you're going to have to spend. At the time of recording, Ethereum is about little less than 900 gigabytes in size. If a ton of people were to put full videos or, or movies or massive images, Ethereum would grow exponentially out of proportion. And this would become unsustainable for the blockchain network as a whole. So Ethereum isn't great for actually storing a ton of data. It can store a lot of data, but it's a lot better for doing the logic and the smart contracts. So there are a lot of different platforms that are actually working on this problem of storage. These platforms allow people to store data in a decentralized way that isn't going to exponentially explode the size of Ethereum or different smart contract platforms. The decentralized storage methodology we're going to work with is going to be IPFS or interplanetary file system. And this is where we're actually going to store our image. And this is actually where we're going to store our image so that NFT marketplaces know what our NFT looks like. Now, here's what some protocols do. Some protocols just set up a server and set this token URI to instead be from a decentralized service like IPFS and use just maybe their own centralized server. This is obviously a massive issue because if their server goes down or if they want to change the uh, image or they want to change the stats, all they have to do is change it in their server. And this is why a protocol like IPFS is going to be a lot easier, quicker and more decentralized version of doing this. The full solution is going to be using something with IPFS and Filecoin, but easy solutions to do that are still being built out. So for now, we're just going to use IPFS because it's free, it's quick, and it's easy, and it can be expanded to combine with Filecoin to be even easier to work with. Now, something else that I want to touch on too. When it comes to this metadata, right now, all these NFT marketplaces only know how to pull attributes from this token URI. Now, if we want to build really cool NFTs that can interact with each other, Having some attributes or maybe some like, like attack stats or attack moves like in Pokemon, for example, or trading cards, we can't just store these in this token URI because the blockchain doesn't know anything about this token URI. So we actually need to store these attributes on chain. I'm really hoping in the future, a lot of these NFT marketplaces are going to get better at and pulling metadata from on chain. But now, right now, any attribute that we give our NFTs, we actually have to reproduce in the token metadata and the token URI as well. So we've just learned a lot about metadata, IPFS, token URIs, and everything like that. Let's update this simple NFT to be able to render on OpenSea and render on these NFT platforms. Because right now, if we were to deploy this, nobody would know what this doggy looks like. So let's give it a token URI. So in this crate collectible, let's do string memory token URI. And after we call this safe mint function, there's another function that we're importing called set token URI. And we're going to set the token URI for the token ID 
and we're going to give it this token URI. This will allow our NFT to actually have an image associated with it that we can actually see. So let's go ahead and so let's go ahead and create a script that's going to deploy this NFT factory contract and then create us a collectible. So we're going to do new file. We'll call it deploy and create dot pi and let's jump into our script. So we'll do def main. First, we need to start with an account and once again, we can go ahead and create helpful scripts dot pi. We can go ahead and copy paste this get account function in here if you want. But of course, since we added this config wallet from key, we're going to go to our running config. We'll add wallets from key, and we're going to grab our private key environment variable. Since we're using a private key, again, we're going to create a dot env, and we need our to export private key, and we're also going to need to export our Web3 Infura project ID. So we can just copy paste for my last project, the private key, Web3 Inferior Project ID, and our Etherscan token so that we can actually verify this on chain. And we'll add a new file in it.py so that older versions of Python know that this is indeed a package. So we'll go ahead and do from scripts dot helpful scripts import get account. Now all we have to do is import our simple collectible and run simple collectible equals simple collectible dot deploy and if we look our at and if we look at our simple collectible we have no constructor parameters here so we can just do from account and now this will have our simple collectible deployed now we need to actually call this now we actually need to call this create collectible function and we're going to pass it a string which is going to be this token uri I'm going to go ahead and use this sample token URI that is included in our NFT mix. So if you're looking to get this token URI, look up NFT mix, Patrick Collins, hopefully the GitHub will show right up and we can just go right to the scripts in here in the simple collectible folder, create collectible that with the big free. And we're going to grab this and in our script, we're going to do sample token URI equals this. Now when you paste this token URI in your browser, if you can't see it, you might have to add something like IPFS companion to your browser like this. Some browsers don't natively have it. So, so there is a link to IPFS companion for this project in the GitHub repo. But now that we have a token URI, we can call this create collectible function. So we'll do transaction equals simple collectible dot create collectible and we'll pass in this sample token URI and then of course we'll do from account we'll do tx dot wait we'll wait for one block and then if we've done this correctly we'll actually be able to see this NFT on an NFT marketplace like OpenSea so let's do a quick print line here we'll do print awesome you can now you can view your NFT at, and we'll do this in F string. And this is where we're going to put the OpenSea URL for this rink B. So we're going to say OpenSea URL, which is going to be equal to, if we pop over to OpenSea, if we pop over to this OpenSea pug here on the rink B testnet, we can go ahead and grab this first start of the string. So it's going to be HTTPS testnets.opensea.io slash assets. And then this is the address of the contract. So we can say OpenSea URL is going to be this slash. And we'll put this little brackets here slash and then another one of these. And this is because the URL for here, testnets.opensea.io slash assets. It's the contract address and then the token ID on the end here. So this is what it's going to look like. 
So in our print line, awesome, you can view your NFT, openc.format, simple collectible dot address, comma, and we do simple collectible dot token counter minus one for the most recently deployed one. And then we'll run this now. Brownie runs scripts, deploy and create, network, Rinkaby. And awesome, we get this print line here saying, awesome, you can view your NFT at HTTPS testnets.opensea.io. Just keep in mind, obviously for mainnet, we can't use this testnets.opensea.io, but assets, the address of the NFT contract, and then the token ID as well. So if we go ahead and click this, and it looks like it's already actually been rendered here in OpenSea. We could even go ahead and hit refresh metadata just in case it doesn't show up right away, but it looks like for us, it did show up right away which is awesome. Some other kind of fun parts about OpenSea is if we go to our profile here, we'll actually be able to see all of the NFTs that we own on this testnet. I've actually deployed this, this doggy twice here, once to test and then once to actually do it. Great, we've created our simple collectible. Of course, no project is complete without some tests. So let's create some tests. Since we're also gonna be doing an advanced collectible, I'm gonna skip the integration test and I'm just gonna write a really simple unit test. So. We'll create a new folder and we'll call it unit. And in here, we'll do a new file, test, simple collectible.py. So let's create our first test. We'll do def test can create simple collectible. And we'll just make sure that we can actually create a simple collectible. Now we'll make sure that this is our unit test. So we'll do from scripts, that helpful scripts, import local blockchain environments. And then we'll do if network.show active, not in local blockchain environments, pytest.skip. So we, of course we need to do from brownie, import network, and then also import pytest. Now, something that we could do here is actually in our test, we could go ahead and even test our scripts by importing uh, deploy and create here and testing this. We can do something like return simple collectible. And in our test, then we could do from scripts dot deploy and create, import, deploy and create. And then back in our deploy and create script, we can modify this a little bit. Instead of main here, we'll call this deploy and create. And then we'll have our main function just call deploy and create, and you'll see Brownie run scripts, deploy and create to Pi. If we go ahead and run this, again, we can just run this on the development network real quick instead of on RinkP. You'll see that this does also work. Obviously, we won't actually be able to see our NFT on OpenSea because this is deployed to the Brownie temporary Ganache chain as opposed to a persistent RinkP chain. In our test here, we could then just do, we could just run simple collectible equals deploy and create. And then we'll do an assert here. We'll assert simple collectible that owner of zero is gonna be equal to get account. And then we'll also import get account. So we can run Brownie test, make sure this works and perfect. Now, this was all fun and dandy, but there's a couple of things that we didn't go over and that we didn't do. So let's create a quick readme.md for a couple of notes. So number one, we didn't upload an image to IPFS ourselves. So we just used a token URI that was already existing, right? We didn't actually upload something to IPFS. We didn't go over why is IPFS decentralized? We didn't really talk too much about what IPFS is. Number three, Anyone can mint an NFT here with any type of stats, right? It's not going to be, it's not verifiably scarce or random, right? This isn't that cool. So we want to actually build an NFT project that has all these pieces where we upload the image to IPFS ourselves. We're going to talk a little bit more about why IPFS is decentralized and it's the preferred solution for storing NFT metadata. 
and we're gonna make our NFT more verifiably random and verifiably scarce, like for things like Ether cards and Avagochi. Let's go ahead and do this project again, but we'll integrate the Chainlink VRF to make this NFT verifiably scarce and verifiably random. And then we'll also teach you guys